So, what we call Saturnian influence really is a type of blockage. And the blockage really exists in self-consciousness. The deliberate aim of the blockage is to create eventual ownership for an aspect of the psyche. And it achieves this by blocking the normal flow of knowledge, awareness. Because remember, I told you that all knowledge is self-knowledge. It doesn't matter what the subject is. Knowledge doesn't contain subjects. They are broken down into subjects in order to aid understanding. But knowledge is always unitary and whole. And it's always related to self-consciousness. So when you study about the universe, you're really studying about yourself. This is sacrosanct. It's invaluable. Okay? As long as you are human learning about something. Okay? Now, what Saturn does is to block the easy awareness, the easy flow of awareness in a particular area of your life. For instance, the astrological houses, they are particular spheres of experience. Now, these spheres are as artificial as the different discourses in knowledge. They're just to aid understanding because these spheres are unitary. They are always related in a holistic manner. Okay? The division into 12 is just to help understanding. So Saturn finds itself in a house or in a sign. Now, we're not going to deal with the sign that much because Saturn is very slow moving. It takes three years to go through a house or three years to go to a sign. But Saturn's movement through the houses depends on what the ascendant is. And so we're going to focus on Saturn in the fifth house or in Leo because the characteristics are virtually the same. And Saturn enacts its effect by blocking the easy flow of awareness in that area. The aim of blocking the easy flow is to ensure that the individual strives and puts effort in that area as a conscious will. That is, they have to make the decision to invest their time and resources in that area. And what Saturn does, as we can see, is it draws out a more powerful response from the individual because now you have to basically focus in that area and deliberately toil in that area towards an objective that is quite far in the future. That's always the case. And the natural instinct of the individual is to avoid that area. Doesn't matter where Saturn is in your natal chart. Your first instinct to that area is to avoid it entirely. Why? Because it denotes a kind of fear. Why? Because you don't understand what that area is. And the lack of understanding means that there is a lack of connection. And once the connections don't exist, then the individual feels isolated in that area. You feel alone. And you feel like you have to battle this alone. And so the natural tendency is towards avoidance. But that's not where it ends. The aspect which this blockage is taking place is so crucial to the life story that avoidance simply means that the life story cannot really take off. The individual cannot really achieve their goals and they feel like something is missing. Now, when you take this to the limit, the individual experiences so much frustration in not being able to move forward that they have no choice but to focus on the area where Saturn is. And there begins the Capricornian journey, the Saturnian journey, because it's a journey. And the ultimate test of that journey is perseverance to assess the strength of character possessed by the human. And it's not about whether you do the right thing or whether you improve. Sometimes the frustration is just deliberate. It's just designed to frustrate the hell out of you. Okay? So that you may apply the right solutions, but it's not the right time, so everything fails. Or you may apply wrong solutions. It's the right time looking for the right solutions, and then the whole thing fails. And the failures continue. Because... Failure is something that you can have two responses to failure. You can decide to give up or you can decide to try again. What the Saturnian influence wants is for you to try again. Now, remember, there's nothing like Saturn really. These things don't really exist. They're just educational tools. They are ways of explaining different aspects of the psyche. Because that Saturn is you. And there is something about that area of your life that frightens you so much. Okay, it frightens you to the point where you freeze so that the natural flow of your consciousness in that area is impaired. Now, this is taking place at a part of your consciousness that you do not have a will over. So it is acting sort of automatically. Now, the aim is to override this conscious programming by exposing yourself to that fear. 
Now, initially, it's going to be a disaster. It's always the case. That's what learning is. Human learning is very predictable. You know, very few people, very, very few people become quite good at something very quickly. Most people, the general trend is you try to walk and then you fall. But then you get up again and you try to walk again and then you fall. You fall for as long as your ears need time to calibrate your sense of balance. It's the same thing that happens in the Saturnian journey or the Capricornian journey. You keep falling, but each fall gives you a certain amount of information regarding the stability that you need. You learn. And that is the essential point. Why? Because that learning is what confers the sense of ownership to the individual when they eventually begin to achieve their goals. There is something about the way human psyche is structured that needs this ownership because the ownership is there to combat the absence of that feeling. And what is that absence? In the absence of ownership, the individual feels ashamed. They feel guilty. Now, it's not a guilt because of something they have done. It's not a shame because of something they have done. It's a natural sense of guilt and a natural sense of shame. Why? Because it is in the area where Saturn is that the individual can feel a connection to the divine presence. This is something nobody tells you. It's something you're not really going to hear anywhere else. That is, it is in the area where you have Saturn in your natal chart that you feel the strongest connection to the divine. But you don't know what it is. And you cannot explain it. You know, it's like standing next to a, a magnificent king or a magnificent queen. And then you look at yourself, you're, you know, you're pretty banged up, you're pretty just ordinary, maybe even less than ordinary. And that confers a sense of shame. It's almost like you're trying to get something from this king or this queen that you didn't deserve or that you don't deserve. And that imbues the individual with a sense of shame and guilt that they cannot shake because the only way to get rid of it is to transact that shame or that lack of unworthiness that the individual feels is to transact it with effort. That is to try to earn their keep in that area. Now, there's nothing you can say to this individual that will make them override this internal programming. Some do as part of an avoidance strategy because, like I said, where you have Saturn is where you are so afraid to even try because you're afraid of failure because Saturn in its proprietary nature indicates a type of social acceptance okay now the converse of this means that you fail in such a public way that everyone laughs at you they ridicule you all right because they see that you're less than ordinary in that area it is this ridicule that the individual fears the most why because it is a type of reminder of the way they felt or the way they feel when they stand next to the divine and they realize their total unworthiness and so they feel a sense of shame that they cannot shake. So they don't want the life story to reflect this sense of shame. So they avoid that area altogether until they begin to understand that really this is unavoidable. Okay, there's simply no escape. It is they who have decided that this area must be that way because there's a huge achievement potential lurking behind that fear. And that achievement potential is necessary to unlock that part of their psyche so that it is more free flowing because without the 12 connections that are complete and connected the individual cannot feel whole and so the life story cannot feel whole and unity and holisticness is something that we come here to achieve because it's something that we forget that's what makes us come here to realign ourselves with unity to reconcile ourselves back to unity okay and the unity remember is a unity of knowing a unity of understanding. And that is the process of reconciling ourselves back to the divine. It's why we do everything we do. It's to achieve that unity. To bring it back as a sense of self. Because the achievement and the attainment of that is the nature of transcendence. Alright? That's really what it is. Now, Saturn rules the sign of Capricorn. The moon rules the sign of Cancer. Now, in your natal chart, you see that the sign of Capricorn lies opposite the sign of Cancer. Why? Because the sign of Cancer is the foundation for self-acceptance. And there's a process by which that is built in the psyche. But foundation really means something in the psyche. It represents a type of root, a grounding of some kind. It allows you to know who you are. And you cannot know who you are if you don't know where you are coming from. Okay? 
And there's an elaborate process by which this is understood in the natal chart. The natal chart always speaks about these things in various arrangements. But it is necessary to achieve that grounding before you can achieve whatever life story is in Capricorn or whatever is in the Capricornian journey or a Saturnian journey. So usually, when there's a life challenge in the Capricornian story, there is a corresponding sense of balance in the Cancerian journey, the foundational root. Because if you have to reach for a fruit high up in the tree, well, you need to stand on something. And that thing needs to be stable. Otherwise, when you reach up for the fruit high in the tree, you will fall. Okay? So the axis from the sign of Cancer to the sign of Capricorn always deals with the ability to raise ourselves up. And the process of raising ourselves up is the process of vanquishing this guilt and this shame. Because we perform actions that, based on our own internal self-assessment, can prove to us that we are worthy to receive a connection to the divine. Without it, there's simply no way. And this exists for everybody. Everybody's natal chart. Okay? It's the process of raising yourself up. Now, it's not because you're not an elevated being. You're a soul. So it means that you are, in a sense, very sovereign, very elevated. But as a human story, you cannot accept this. You need to match that ability to receive with effort. Otherwise, you simply cannot reach. Now, if you have a Capricornian story, interwoven with a cancerian story and you look for shortcuts because sometimes that is something that exists within the natal chart because of the avoidance strategy the defensive mechanisms of the saturnian they're sophisticated only comparable to the defensive mechanisms exist in the scorpio and the defensive mechanisms are there to protect the ego from the potential shame that it can feel and so it is a tendency to take shortcuts to look for easy ways to achieve things just to avoid this sense of being ridiculed Okay? And that always backfires. Always. It's a trap. It's meant to be part of the learning process. So that you fall harder. So that you experience an even deeper level of shame. And then you realize that you haven't solved your problem. You've only made it worse. Because you need that effort. It's not somebody that is imposing it on you. It's you that has imposed it on yourself. Because without it, you cannot pull yourself up. You cannot reach for your own exaltation. Okay? That is the gift that the divine presence gives to you. Your own exaltation. Because you are not really exalting yourself, really. You are pulling yourself into the presence of the divine. It's just that now, you can accept it. You can convince yourself at that level that you deserve this type of gift or you deserve this type of presence. Okay? Now, it's not something you can con. A lot of people go about, you know, trying to look for sh ways to shortcut this. They're wasting their time, eventually. That's why Saturn is known as some type of karmic response or some type of karmic behavior. What they don't tell you is that there's really no Saturn. These things don't really exist. They are ways of understanding something that otherwise may remain impenetrable. Okay? So they're just learning tools. They help us to focus in on what we need to know to complete us. All right? That's a mistake many, many, many people make. They think that these things have an existence outside of themselves. They don't. There is nothing. Okay? Whatever knowledge you have in your head is just part of your own self-consciousness. Whatever you're learning about, you are only learning about yourself. And when you learn about yourself and begin to achieve the intimate knowledge about yourself, then you are learning about the divine. Okay? Because it is the divine that is you. That's really what it is. If you want to think it's complicated, well, it's not really. It is just the realization that there is no universe really out there per se. There's no out there. Everything is always holistic. So that it is that which is in you that connects to what you consider to be outside of you. They're a seamless whole. But this is very hard to realize in a reality system like we have today that has focused on the boundary conditions of everything as a way of realizing some type of make-believe value. And that's why people tend to focus on skin, skin color, skin this, skin that. Because the skin is the boundary between what you consider to be your internal self and what you consider to be your external self. It's the nature of countries. It's the same type of thinking that created countries. There's a reason why countries are simply just recent artifacts or constructs. 
they didn't exist before because nobody really, nobody thought about these types of things that way. What do you mean by a country? You mean if you walk towards the boundary of a country, there's going to be some type of natural barrier. There's nothing there. Try explaining the nature of a country to a goat. It doesn't understand what that is. It just walks across the barrier as if it, there's nothing there because there's nothing there. The boundary is self-delusion. It's something that you have to enforce. And when you have to enforce something like that, you realize you are dealing with something that you just made up. It's like a story in your head. Okay? That's what happens when the individual has become convinced that there is actually an objective reality out there, outside of everything. What do you mean outside of everything? What does that even mean? And that's what happens when the Sartonian principle has gone amok. It's gone crazy. It has blocked the individual so far that the individual now believes that they are isolated. They're alone. And that breeds fear. Okay? Because that fear originates from isolation. It's a lack of connections, which means it's a lack of understanding. And from fear comes hate, the need to separate the self and to keep the self safe against what you now consider to be external enemies. Because you don't know what they are, you don't know who they are. Okay? So at some point in time, especially as we progress deeper into the age that we are in, this realization will dawn on people that, listen, there's really nothing there. There are no barriers, there's nothing. Okay? The aim of focusing on boundaries is to try to preserve some type of intrinsic delusional value system which is just a story that everyone just made up at some point in time. Now, the moon's gift and the sign of cancer's gift is a sense of conviction that is really built from self-acceptance. Once this is achieved, then the individual begins to evolve further towards the sign of Capricorn, wherein which that conviction is now demonstrated as a social acceptance. So you have an opposition that exists between self-acceptance and social acceptance. It's not really an opposition, you know, because they're not in conflict. You need to achieve one in order to achieve the other. So for some people, they are denied self-acceptance in the early stages of their life because that's when it is crucial that self-acceptance is formed, okay? There is an entire transactional dynamic that creates and generates self-acceptance, okay? Now, when self-acceptance is denied, then the individual does not know who or what they are. They have no roots. Now, it's not a question of knowing where your physical home is. That's not what it is. Okay, astrology does not code for physical things per se. We're talking about a root system for self-awareness in order to understand intuitively and deeply its own emanation. Once that doesn't sit in the individual, then the individual goes looking for it outside of themselves. Usually this happens when the moon finds itself in Capricorn or when the moon is conjunct Saturn or something. There's always something in the sign of cancer or related to the moon that denies the ability to express this self-acceptance easily. And so what you are denied inside you, you go looking for it as an external in that sense. Okay? That's really what it is. Now, the sign of Leo is really concerned with self-expression. Now, you cannot express yourself if you don't know who you are. Because the sign of Leo is really concerned with role play. It is the birth of the one who is telling the story on a willful level. Prior to the birth of Leo or prior to the birth of the ego, the story is told at a point where the individual is not really conscious of it. They are acting on reflex and instinct. Okay? But at some point in time, the ego kicks in. The individual suddenly becomes aware of the narrative and then takes over. And this is a source of joy. Because that's what the ego is. The ego is a construct that assimilates joy. And it participates in the creative process. It really is just an observer, but it doesn't know this. Okay? The fact that it is aware of the story as it is being told is enough to delight it. And so it searches these narratives that are now being told on a willful level. As an observational status, that is. It searches those narratives for glimpses of itself. It wants validation regarding what it is. Now, Anytime it catches a glimpse of itself, that is, I did this, or I created this, oh, this is me, oh, I did, anytime it catches a glimpse of that, its joy literally just catapults into the stratosphere. It is extremely elated, and so the ego is an empowered point in the psyche. That's really what it is. There's a lot of bad rep given to the ego. You know, you have words like egotistical and all that, but that's not what the ego really does. The ego has no need to be egotistical. When that is happening, is because the ego has been denied a natural sense of self-expression. Now, when that blockage is enacted, then the ego tries to compensate by being egotistical or being boastful or being whatever. 
But that's not the way that it normally works. The ego is like a, a circus ringleader, all right? Setting the stage, coordinating as a maestro in some sense. And it coordinates. It arranges. But here's the truth. The ego is not really doing any of that. It thinks it's doing that. And so what it really needs is validation that it is in control. And because of that, it needs to evolve further. And so Leo doesn't stay where it is. It needs to evolve. It needs to evolve to the point where it can provably demonstrate that it is in control. And do you know where this is found? This is found in Aquarius. That's why Aquarius sits opposite Leo. So Leo is the individualized ego, while Aquarius is the socialized ego. But it's all the ego. It's all narrative, storytelling, the empowerment that comes from storytelling. Being able to tell your own story, being able to tell the story of others, being able to narrate what is going on in the world. It's the very definition of role play. Okay? And that is why, in Leo, the ego searches for self-significance, self-importance. And that revolves around the simple question, what am I? Who am I? What have I come here to do? What is my purpose? But you see, the ego doesn't just come out of thin air. It is born from conviction. It is born from self-acceptance, which is what happens in the sign of cancer. Okay? And in that way, the entire narrative in the natal chart is linked into one. Because all the signs are really just one thing. All right? They're just different perspectives on one thing. And what is being acquired is self-knowledge. So that by the zero degrees of Aries, which is the natural ascendant, the individual is born as an ignorant person, or an ignorant child, or an ignorant being. Now, the ignorance is based on the fact that the child doesn't know what it is, it doesn't know where it is, it doesn't know what anything is, really. It's just born with certain types of drives. It doesn't even know that these drives exist. It's just born with certain types of drives. Now, the drives themselves are an internal wiring. That internal wiring and the pattern of it is what you call the sign that sits on the ascendant. That's really what it is because that now forms the initial launch pad for how the self will go about acquiring from the zero degrees of Aries to the 30th degree of Pisces. What it's acquiring is self-knowledge. And it will do this in a myriad number of ways. It just wants to know what it is. And by doing so, reconcile itself back to unity. And there are many challenges. Those challenges, that's what the human experience is all about. It's all about acquiring self-knowledge based on the nature of these challenges. And everybody comes into existence to acquire a certain type of self-knowledge that matches their soul level contract. Because every soul comes into physical existence for a reason. It is purpose and intent that brings them into physical existence. So everybody is patterned in a very different way. And then they come here looking for answers to a question that originated before they were born. That's really what it is. Now, you still think you're listening to your basic astrology? Think again. This is something else entirely, on a different level entirely. You are looking at a soul-level contract that gets interpreted as a human story. And that now forms the basis, conscious or otherwise, of the human life pattern, what you call your destiny. And you go seeking that, even though you may not be aware of anything on any level, but you have these drives. Now, the initial drives are wired in such a way that they lead you in how to connect to your life story. And you go doing that because that means that on some level of your being, you already know. And what that tells us is that the nature of choice is not the way that we understand it. Choice requires ignorance. And what you live in, the physical reality, is a mimicry of the ignorance as it manifests in what you call physicality. And as a result of that, you are born into a space and you are born into a time. These constructs are repositories for that which is unknown. Because you can imagine that physics will tell you that the distance between two points can be calculated based on the speed of light. How long it will take light to go from one place to another. But what is light? You think light is some type of physical construct that exists out there? It doesn't. Light is the way that your physical perspective perceives its own awareness. So when light reaches you, you think you have received information. But there's a whole chunk of the universe that doesn't connect or interact with light. So what's going on there? Hmm? It is because physicality is a perspective. You need to think in terms of, you know, a tuning fork or a resonance of some kind or some type of antenna 
maybe on your TV, like a tuning circuit. Every tuning circuit in your TV or your radio or your transmitter is an RLC circuit. That is a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor linked together in some way. And their job is to create certain types of frequencies or certain types of uh, vibrations. Okay? Now, when you tune your TV or your radio, you tune into a particular frequency. And then you can receive if there's a broadcast on that frequency. So, the universe literally contains all these frequencies and all these vibrations and whatever. Physicality is just a tuning in. You just tune into a particular aspect of it. Alright? Now, the aim is not to get stuck there. The aim is to recalibrate, retune. Because there is no difference between spirituality and physicality. There's none, really. It's just a perspective. Where are you focused on? All right? Now, Saturn is the ultimate focusing instrument. It's the ultimate focusing part of the psyche. It needs the physicality. It needs the structure so that the human story can be implemented. Because the human story is an experiment of some kind. You're trying to answer a question. And the question is an extremely simple one. It's always very simple. But it's always posed to the divine. When you ask the divine a question, the divine must respond. And it responds by sending you here. Because the fact that the question arises means that there is something that has happened. That has decoupled you from the nature of paradise. Which is the nature of all knowing. So what happened? Well, that's what you see in the human interpretation of that soul level contract. That's what you see in your natal chart. You see the question if you know how to read the story. Because what you are reading is the implementation of the answer to that question. So from knowing what the answer is supposed to be, you can begin to intuit the question itself. And then everything becomes very clear to you because you realize that you are actually here for the simplest of reasons. And you begin to wonder, what is this? What is all of this? Such a simple reason and yet look at it. It's so hidden. All right. You look at physical existence. You're talking about light years, billions of light years. What is this? That is how the divine is hidden within the physical perspective because you can no longer see it clearly. So you think that there is a universe, a physical universe out there made up of all these constructs. But when you really look at it, you see, and I've proven this in my book, The Five Principles of Organized Complexity. And in the podcast, the recent podcast, The Biochemistry of Living Memory, The Physics of Blackness, Part 1 to 6, right? I have proven that those same constructs you see in the arrangement or the organization of your physical reality, they are in your head. They are in you. That's what you are made of. So which physicality are you really looking at? Which construct are you really looking at? You just don't know that you are looking at your own ignorance. The manifestation of what you don't know. And that looks like a universe. But that what you don't know, that is the nature of the question. That's the way the question manifests. Because you are a human. And every human exists with that question. That's questioning process. That's what human self-awareness really is. Because the human is the one that questions what it is. It questions where it comes from. It questions everything. Why do you think that is the case? So you are an arrangement designed to question. You are an organizational scheme that really contains a question. And your aim is to answer that question. And by answering your question, you dematerialize physicality. You collapse the entire universe. Because it's nothing. It's basically just the potential that is brought into existence by the question. Okay? And when people die, the moment they are gone, they realize all right, they realize that's what is called awe. You know, you realize that wait a second, wait a whole damn minute, there is nothing. What do you think they begin to do? They begin to laugh. <laughs> How could I have been so deluded? All right, now, you know, this is overstanding basically. All right, this is not an actual thing, we're just being figurative here because the nature of paradise is such that when a child is born from paradise into the physical existence, their mind needs to be wiped off. They need to forget everything about the reality system they come from. Because if they don't, the child will die immediately. Because nobody wants to be here, considering where they're coming from. The moment a child is born with a full memory of this, and they realize that they are now a physical being, they will immediately go back. So, they are born with tabula rasa. That is, a type of wiping of the mind. So, when the child is born, it is born into a type of fear. Because it doesn't know what it is. It doesn't know where it comes from. It doesn't know anything. And so it is very vulnerable. But that vulnerability is how the human story begins. Okay? 
when Saturn is in the fifth house or in Leo, what it does is it blocks the manifestation of objectives because the ruler of Leo or the fifth house is the sun. The sun is representative of the will. And so when Saturn is in the fifth house or in Leo, it blocks the will. And the will delights in manifesting things because that manifestation is evidence that it is in control of its own narrative. And so the individual has trouble achieving objectives. And you know, we base our entire society, modern society, on the achievement of objectives. If you cannot achieve objectives, I'm talking about the general average objectives that humans strive for living in the 21st century, right? Then you feel like a failure. And this is what scares the Saturn in the fifth house the most. The fact that they will be bunched up with everybody else as some type of below average type of failure. No. When Saturn is in the fifth house or in the sign of Leo, you want to stand out. Because that is your way of pushing back against this oppressive force that tries to limit your self-expression. And so you go looking for objectives that you can succeed in. But you are constantly frustrated with failure. Doesn't matter what it is, because you are trying to manifest objectives as evidence of your own unique specialness, and then all of that fails, and it fails continuously, and you get frustrated. You get so frustrated that you begin to wonder, what the hell is this all for? And as a result of that, your pride, your self-pride, begins to be enveloped in doubt. And what that simply means is that you begin to replace the natural instinct for self-significance. It begins to be replaced with self-insignificance. You begin to feel insignificant. So your shoulders droop, your head comes low, and you no longer have the spunk and the vitality that you once had because you have been met with a frustrating amount of failures. You begin to doubt everything. You begin to question everything. Now, you have two responses to this. You can go away and sulk in depression or sadness and be enveloped by this. And usually people start pretending as part of the way of defending their ego. Or you can decide to dig in even further because that's the entire process. That's the entire reason for the blockage. So you dig in. You achieve a level of depth in that area of your life. That is, in being able to create these narratives, to understand them. Because what is blocked is the ego's ability to manifest these narratives. Now, those narratives, they're born from conviction. Because it is conviction that gives birth to the ego. Now, conviction needs a test. Otherwise, how do you know that it is a conviction? The test is always found in Libra or the seventh house. Because Libra and the seventh house, they're a screen. That's how the world appears in front of your eyes. They're like a television screen or a flat LCD screen. But that's the universe as it appears in front of your eyes. And on that screen is projected all your convictions. Now, the ego's job is to carry those convictions from the sign of cancer into the sign of Libra. But Leo cannot go into the sign of Libra. It can't. Because Leo is very individualistic. It really has no space for anybody else. So, Leo needs to be tempered. It needs to be attenuated. Not diminished. Attenuated. Which means a translation of the basic impulse that Leo carries. And that is the job of Virgo. To attenuate the ego of Leo. So as to make space for relationships in Libra. Now, when Saturn is in the fifth house or in Leo, it begins to focus on these areas, these screens that Libra represents. And so these begin to show up in relationships in the engagement of relations, because people carry realities in their heads. So when you have a relationship, it's a relationship between two types of realities, negotiating with each other, looking for common ground. And that's where this blockage begins to show up. Now, the individual can pretend in so many ways, okay? They can even pretend to have great relationships, and they do so by doing something else, usually indicated somewhere in the natal chart, somewhere else in the natal chart. But the reality of Libra is that you must make space for another. You must. Okay? You cannot pretend this process because the pretense itself can only get you so far before you realize that people actually don't like you at all. They may have only associated with you based on what you can give to them or based on something they give or something. Either they maybe they're even afraid of you. But they don't like you one bit. They don't consider you a genuine partner. Okay? And you may not know this for many years. Because that is part of your way of managing what you failed to deal with because you are afraid of ridicule. Okay? And that's usually indicated in the natal chart where the ego wears certain types of jackets or certain types of clothes to prevent itself from looking naked. And it can carry this on for many years 
until maybe a platonic transit comes around, sees the inauthenticity of that nonsense and breaks it all down. So as to free the individual into the opportunity to develop anew. Now, it's an opportunity. If you don't take it, you set up the same cyclical process all over again. And so the individual experiences periodic upheavals and crises that simply seems to change their lives. You know, it depends on the frequency of this thing. But the dynamic is taking place deep within them because there's really nothing out there. So just like when the moon is impaired or the sign of cancer is impaired, so self-acceptance is denied the individual and they go looking for it as social acceptance in Capricorn. When Saturn is in the fifth house or Saturn is in Leo, then the individual must seek to respond in Aquarius and they must take the externalization of the need for objectives, which is that they create something that appears to be outside of themselves and that now serves as a lightning rod for others. Once that lightning rod is demonstrated in the sign of Capricorn, it's not enough. It must find acceptance in Aquarius. Now, Aquarius is a future-oriented expectation, and it is dealing with those people who have moved beyond the established order into crafting a new type of order that is developing on the fringes. Now, that is where the lightning rod must go to find acceptance. It must now find acceptance within a specialized group of people with unique skills, which is the Aquarian type of group. It's like a professional group. There they find the validation. The question that was raised in Leo or in the fifth house, what's so special about me? And then that is now answered in the sign of Aquarius or in the eleventh house. Okay? That's how it works.